Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tapping the Wine Cellar, where we are covering Father Robert Schreider's book, In Water and in Blood, Chapter 5. We're going to start off today with Father Keith. So, Father Keith, you may take it. Thank you, Margaret. This is, this is one of my favorite chapters in the book. I can really relate to this chapter. This chapter covers Luke's account of Gethsemane, the, the agony in the garden. And what I really feel is great is he's, he's seen the word agony, the Greek root agonia, and taken it a different way. Father Schreider tells us that that was a type way that athletes prepared for competition, agonia. Jesus, in this account of the Garden of Gethsemane, it isn't quite like Matthew or Mark. Jesus is less anxious, he's more composed, and it, he's more in control of himself. He doesn't go back and forth to the disciples but once, and he's very focused, even praying so intensely, his sweat falls to the ground like drops of blood. And also, Bob tells us that in ancient training manuals, there were cases where, an, where someone would sweat such so that blood would appear in their sweat. And so this is kind of an indication that Jesus is ready for the great competition, for the arena that he's about to perform in. And perform is really a good way to put it. So this, this takes us a different way and probably gives us a better example of what we do in our times of trial, how we are people of resistance. And if Newton is all right, I will toss it to him. I actually felt I had a lot of emotional resistance to Schreider's way of interpreting the Lucan passion, particularly uh, in one line where he describes, this is on page 52, that God is with him to strengthen him is confirmed by the appearance of a divine emissary, an angel who, like an athletic trainer, guides him to the next level of preparation. I felt like to focus on an interpretation of the word agonia where we are thinking of this as almost a wrestling match might trivialize the passion of Christ. And I wanted to hear more of your opinion, Father Keith or Vicky, on whether you feel differently. Um, Newton, I agree with you a little bit, but in a different sense in that I think what Bob, the brilliance again of Bob's writing in this chapter is he humanized Jesus for us. You know, when you, when you, when you hear this every year during the Holy Week liturgies, um, sometimes I think we hear Jesus praying and use it as an example. And it's an example that we think we can't reach. But Bob gives us a better opportunity to say, yes, in this time of prayer, we can reach this. But one of the things that I really liked about this example, first and foremost, is, again, going back to the connection that Bob made earlier on in the book, at this intense prayer moment that Jesus had, he, it's the spiritual touching the physical. So it's that, that, that sacred moment of prayer that Jesus Jesus reaches where the blood comes out. And I really like that. But more importantly, um, Bob's reflection gave me an opportunity to see this scripture passage in a new light in that Jesus needed at this time when he was about to face his biggest contest, so to speak, communion with God. He didn't necessarily need the disciples. He didn't need the crowds. He didn't need anyone else, but he needed to reach out to that communion with God. And I think as people, 
so often when we are faced with times of trouble, we think of prayer almost as an afterthought. And if we, if we reached out more for that communion with God, would we have a different reality? So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Keith. I agree with you, Vicki. Uh, I think that a lot of us in times of trial tend to fall into what's called foxhole prayers, right? Uh, God, get me out of this. God, get me through this. And we tend to be fervent believers as long as we're in trouble. And then when we're not in trouble anymore, then we're not quite so fervent. What, what strikes me about this, uh, I can't, I've never been an athlete, okay? When I played baseball, you could time me going from home to first with a calendar. But I was a professional musician. Um, but being in that kind of situation requires a special kind of focus, a special time of heightened awareness, and a special way, a time of communion with with many things that are unspoken and you build the resources for this time through your practice through all of those hours you spend in the practice room and to equate practice with prayer makes a lot of sense you get better at prayer the more you pray and seeing prayer as a necessary element in preparation for something big and in jesus day trial of faith. And Bob says the trial of faith is really, can you go through this without breaking? Can you go through this ordeal without losing your faith, without losing your control without, of yourself? And that's, that's the victory, is staying true to who you are and what you believe all the way through to the end. And so in that way, I think that is a rather deep and profound way to view the crucifixion and, and how we, we should view the early martyrs, because they would read this as their prep, or, you know, as part of their everyday faith life. And they would be called into arenas to give witness. And what was amazing is, is Tertullian said, you know, the the blood of the martyrs of the seeds of the church, people in the crowds would see this great faith of these people that met death willingly and joyfully and say, what makes them like that? And this is what Jesus is trying to prepare us for as Christians, although the vast majority of us don't have that kind of trial awaiting us. But this is where I think that this the beauty of this interpretation is and and how it makes it more available to us one of the interesting comments that bob had um he talked about a spirituality of struggle and one of the phrases that struck me was he said endurance is built up only in gradual increments and um because it had i'm only interpreting this because I imagine, as he says, we react to our immediate struggles by reflex, what we've already learned, how what's it deeply embedded within us that we don't even have to think about, we just react to. And as I was reading that, um, I've always been challenged with our um, religious education, how our faith is formed, not only as children, but as adults. And do we do a disservice because we don't have that incremental um, in buildup of our endurance? So when we have those crucifixion moments, we can, again, respond as Jesus did to be in communion with God as we prepare ourselves for whatever the struggle is. I would agree with you. And, and it's like, uh, once again, going back to music, uh, it said that good musicians practice until they learn the notes. Great musicians, artistic musicians practice until they can't get it wrong. 
And so I think this is an example of Jesus being in a place he can't get it wrong. That's his goal in Gethsemane is to get into that kind of mindset and in that kind of insight. And it's uh, an insight and reflexes that he's built up through hours and hours and hours of prayer. All kinds of prayer uh, are good and all kinds of prayer are helpful. And, and we need to remember that, that all kinds of prayer are necessary if we're going to be, let God fully form us into who he's meant us to be, I think. I guess I'm a little bit confused. Is the training to become great and efficient at praying itself? Or is the training that we're describing for Jesus really about him going through his crucifixion. I remember Father Schreider saying in one of our theology classes that the answer to the great theological questions is usually yes. I would have to say both of those elements are, are true, Newton. And that's kind of the paradox and that's kind of the mystery and that's kind of the wonder of faith because it's, it's both an intellectual preparation it's an instinctive preparation, and it's a, it's a preparation of the spirit. It's, it's preparing the spirit to be in such deep communion with God that we have all the resources we need to encounter what we need to encounter, in my humble opinion. This is one of those moments where um, I'm going to wordsmith and say the word training doesn't sit well with me because... Um, I think ultimately what Jesus is trying to teach us through this gospel and through it, and what Luke is trying to share is ultimately, no matter what, communion with God is the most important uh, ring of the ladder to hold on to. And how we do that is going to be different for each one of us. And the glory of it is when we screw up and we do it lesser than we should be, we get a chance to do it all over again. We get do-overs. I always get nervous, though, when we talk about prayer, especially as one who's experienced it for themselves. Um, I think sometimes people think I have to pray like other people. But I would contend there is a place for the traditional prayers of the church. There is a place for our Eucharistic liturgies, but our relationship with God, our communion with God occurs in whatever language we need it to occur. Um, and it occurs in whatever mode we need it to occur. I find for myself, for example, my relationship with God comes in a more visual image versus an oral word. Whatever the language God wants to speak to us, that's the language we have to respond to. And the beauty is there's no wrong answer. I agree. I would say there are many ways to pray and all of them are good. I remember a wonderful book I ran into a few years ago called Temperaments of Prayer that speak about four different types of prayer or four schools of prayer, Benedictine, Franciscan, Thomistic, and Ignatian. And they all have different characteristics and appeal to different kinds of people. But all of them are good ways to pray. And that as we develop our prayer life and find out where we fit, we also have to try the others and to try to draw benefit from the other ways to pray. So I guess I'm saying I agree with you, Vicki. Am I? Yeah. To bring the topic of prayer back to musicianship, I think there was a famous jazz musician who commented that the hardest thing he had to learn was how to play like himself. And I think that is deeply related to the, the way we pray. And I think that all the formulas that we have of praying are good training to an extent, but ultimately we have to pray as ourselves, as a person who is coming to God as themselves with their experiences, their perspectives, and their beliefs. I think that to bring this back into this text, where I'm still feeling a lot of resistance is, 
the training and preparation suggests that what we are trying to do is create a state in which we cannot fail. I would like to contest that there's no place at which Jesus could have failed in this way. That that's part of his divinity and part of who he is, that there's no script. You know, we talk about the four different ways of, of four different, you know, gospels with four different narratives of the crucifixion. There's no script. There's no one in the, in the audience saying, oh, he can only fall two times, but he fell three times. There, there's nobody, you know, there's no, there's no line of thinking in Jesus's was like, oh, I, I said that the wrong way. I need to say it the right way because they need to record it in the Luke and gospel this way, you know? And so to me, the expression of Christ's sacrifice is the pure expression of who he really is. And if we discuss this in terms of training, do we have to train to become who we truly are? Maybe that is itself a question of Christian doctrine. Well, I would like to answer with a quote attributed to Charlie Parker. Learn the scales, learn the arpeggios, learn the modes, forget them, and play. Uh, we have lots of ways. I mean, even when we learn language, we're learning how to describe our world and put our world in terms we can understand it. And so we look at the we look at Jesus example and yes everything you said about Jesus is true Newton. Uh, but the the key for me is is Jesus's example. And I think one thing that gets under under emphasized in Christianity today uh, is taking taking Christ as a model for imitation. And yes, Christ was perfect. Christ, Christ could have probably done anything without preparation. However, we're not Christ. And so we need Christ's example. Oh, if Jesus did this, then maybe we need to pay attention to it. I would venture to say we don't just need Christ's example. We need Christ to go before us and show us the way how to do it. Um, has I have, have I just embraced recently? Um, Christ in this gospel account really shows for me. Uh, he, you're absolutely right. There's no way he's going to fail, but he shows me that he is doing his part in God's plan. And that's what we're called to do. And that's what we're called to embrace. And again, he shows us by going first, this is how you do it. I'm not gonna, I have, I have to add one part that uh, of this chapter that really intrigued me. And that was the part about active waiting. We as a people don't like to wait. I can't stand waiting. Um, I want it now. I want it yesterday. I want it three days ago. We hate waiting. And I really love the way that Bob talked about waiting, that we have to redefine our perceptions and make us more active waiting makes us more attentive, not only to ourselves, but to where our weaknesses are, where our strengths are, and also more attuned to who we encounter. Sometimes I think um, we often, as people in ministry, we think of these are the people who I have to minister to. And Bob always says in his book so far, and I just love it, he always is careful to say, these are the people we minister with. He always uses that word. We don't minister to. So I really like this whole part about active waiting. I think um, if we just stopped for a moment, took a deep breath, a lot of the problems of the world would be solved. I agree with you completely. Uh, active waiting is is valuable to us all in, in daily life because quite frequently we want life to hurry up and get here. And learning how to develop active waiting, waiting without anxiety, waiting without having to make things happen a certain way is, is crucial. I just wanted to pat, tag on to that. Active waiting is, 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 is part of our struggle to make the kingdom happen on earth. Because, you know, if we're part of the kingdom, we're going to be part of struggle. 
our faith isn't going to be uh, landing in heaven now. We, in this world, we have a lot to wo work with. We have a lot to cope with. And active waiting is an important trait for us because we know that we're waiting for a kingdom that probably won't appear in its fullness in our lifetimes. But yet we still have to be true to that kingdom and live as Christ has shown us. As I, I'm listening and I'm thinking about this topic of active waiting, I'm thinking in particular about our companions who may be at various stages in their life and considering what is the thing for them to do at where they are in their life. I know some people have just gotten married. Some people may be in prison and others may be retiring or looking at what the next part of their vocation as a companion is. And I think the art of this sort of active waiting is important, especially for those of us who, are, who have so long defined ourselves by our work or our vocation, to then look at this as simply a continuation of the greatest vocation, the, the waiting and the prayerful expectation of the kingdom of heaven. And I think of that as, as hopefully something that is encouraging to anyone at any point, whether you're a college student waiting to go to college or someone waiting for COVID to go over so they can go outside. There is a lot of room to practice this, this teaching in a way that hopefully adds more to our life and makes it less empty. All right, thank you for joining us this week for Tapping the Wine Cellar. We hope that this review of chapter five was helpful. We hope that you will join us next week for chapter six and we will see you then. Thanks.